Hey, Jeff. Hey, Mick. <laughs> Guess what, brother? We want to wish our listeners a Merry Christmas? That's right. But oh. also, this is the last show of the year that we're ah, doing right now. That's, yes, it is. Yeah. Yes, it is. And we have had every walk of life that we could imagine on this show from uh, the most craziest shredders all the way to the blues guys. But today's show is going to be special because this is one of the originals. And you'll hear it when we get into the show. But we wanted to say Merry Christmas. Merry and Christmas. Thank you for four years, man. That's right. Four and, years, uh, brother. Yeah. You know, hopefully we'll be able to do another four. Um, we'll, we'll see what, we'll see what 2018 brings. We gotta, we gotta look at some things, but it, you know what? I think we're going to be cool. Yeah, I think so too. <laughs> so let's get to it, man. Let's That's get to right. it. right. Neck throughs, guitars, they're like a guy that won't have a beer with you. I want to hear what's pushing the notes. Freddie King and B.B. King, Albert King, and let's not forget Burger King. I don't want to blow my knuckle out. Stainless steel is the work of the devil. These go to 11. From the East Amplification Tone Labs in Baltimore, Maryland, it's the Amps and Axes Show with your hosts, Jeff the Godfather of Low Wattage Amps Bober and Mick Marcelino. Well, good day to you, Mr. Bober. Good day to you, Mr. Marcelino. How are you? Oh, <laughs> yeah. Okay, so do you want to lie or do you want the truth? <laughs> <laughs> hey, yes. you know what though? It's going to be great because today's guest. Ooh. Anyway, hey, speaking of just having a good day, our fans, man, you guys are still kicking it. You're spreading the word. That's all we can ask. And hey, look, we can't do this thing. It's all worked on you guys. So thank you. Right. We can't do it without you. You know, friends, uh, Romans, countrymen. Okay, maybe that's friends, Americans, countrymen. I don't know. <laughs> but, you know. Friends, relatives, anybody you can bring over to the show, we appreciate it. Yeah, man. And look, when you do tell uh, those Romans <laughs> and countrymen, make sure you tell them that you heard it here first. That's right. And, you know, you're, not only are you going to hear something here first today, I hope, yeah, man. but you're going to hear from a guy that's, if you're into blues, yeah. this guy is a shredder. Was there, was, <laughs> this guy was there. When the blues scene in Chicago was producing all the greats, yeah, and he's he's right along with them, man. Yeah. So this is yeah, this is going to be cool. So we're going to take a pause for the cause, come back with our guest of the week, uh, the Chief, Mister Eddie Clearwater. Hey, this is Brian from Wampler Pedals, and you're listening to Amps and Axes. All right, and we are back with our guest of the week, uh, as promised, because we keep our promises around here. So uh, without further ado, we're going to bring in Mr. Eddie, the Chief Clearwater. Mr. Clearwater, how are you? I'm good, except a little hoarse today. Other than that, uh, that's part of being in the blues business, I guess, being hoarse. <laughs> but uh, other than that, I feel very good. It's good to be talking to you, too. Oh, excellent, excellent. Uh, you know, Jeff, uh, I always start with a story, of course, and I got contacted um, by uh, by his, uh, you know, Eddie's uh, PR guy. And he said, would you like to talk to, uh, you know, Eddie, Eddie Clearwater is how he put it. And I was mm -hmm. like, um, you know, how do I say yes in any <laughs> other way that I can possibly get, you know, a blues great like Eddie on the phone? I was like, uh, yeah, what do we got to do? Do I have to move all of the people that I'm in? Just whatever it takes. I don't care how we got to do it. It's going to happen uh, regardless nice. of, you know, it could be raining knives right now out of the sky. We'd be on the phone with Eddie. <laughs> it is indeed a pleasure, believe me. It's well, really thank you pleasure. so thank you so much, Eddie. It's it's indeed our pleasure as well. Absolutely. And uh, we uh, I'm going to do what I do with all of our guests, and um, we're going to take a, 
uh, jump in the Wayback Machine and find out where Mr. Eddie Clearwater was born and raised and how you got into this wonderful, wacky music business and, and what got you into the blues, man. So, and I can't, we can't wait to hear this. So give us some history, Eddie. Yeah, so well, I was born in, I was born in Macon, Mississippi, and I, I moved to Birmingham, Alabama at age 13. And from Birmingham, I moved to Chicago at age 15. Mm. And I have been in Chicago ever since. I made Chicago my home. And I've been here singing the blues kind of all over for quite a few years. So I'm having a real good time with the blues. And it's nice to get to talk to people like yourself and uh, discuss blues because that's, that's the nearest to my heart. That's, that's awesome. Now, we're... Before you settled in Chicago, um, early on in your in your youth, were were you musical? <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, was was anyone in your family musical? Or how did you find you know? How did you find music? Well, I just had it in my my head in my mind. I never had any. Uh, my family was never musical, uh, not professionally. Just to, just to play around the house with the guitars and stuff. But I never had anyone to go out and just make a profession of it. So I just had this, always had this idea in my head that this is what I wanted to do with my life. And I had an uncle that believed in me. Mm-hmm. So he, he would do anything he could to just push me in, the, in that direction, my uncle Houston. And uh, he always encouraged me to, uh, to believe in if I want to do this, he always encouraged me to pursue it, and so I, that was that gave me some encouragement to go forward with it. So he moved to Chicago before I did, from the South. So he knew I really wanted to uh, pursue music as as a career. So he wrote me a letter. I was like 15 years old. He wrote me a letter, and he said, "You always wanted to pursue music as a career. If you come to Chicago, you will get that opportunity." Because there's people in Chicago that's full-time musicians, people like Muddy Waters, mm. Howlin' Wolf, Jimmy Reed, uh, Elmo James, and uh, Little Walter. They were all in Chicago at that time playing music nightly, uh, full-time. And so he said, if you come to... So I wrote him a letter back, and I said, send me a ticket, I'll be on my way at 15. Wow. So he sent me a ticket. For the Greyhound bus for fifteen dollars, and I talked to my grandmother. That's why I was living with my grandmother and grandfather in, in Birmingham. So they said, "We'll go if you believe in it," because they knew that was their son, which was my uncle. They said, "If if Houston wants to see after you, you're welcome to go and go to Chicago and pursue your dream." So I took off on the Greyhound bus. I got to Chicago at twelve o'clock at night. And believe me, that was scary. Saying I said it that big, I never said it that, <laughs> that big in my life. <laughs> so the bus took me. I got to the Greyhound bus station. I got a cab to my uncle's place on on the west side of Chicago. So when we got to the address, he pointed. It was pretty dark. He pointed to the house. He said, "That's that's the house. That's fifteen fifteen forty South Holman Avenue." So I uh, got out and I paid him and uh, went, went and knocked on the door. My uncle let me in. So I, the rest is history, I guess, because I've been Man. here ever since. You know? What a story. <laughs> it, yeah, it was 1950, right? It was, it was 1950 September, when you made that move, right? September of 1950, that's correct. Wow. wow. Yeah. And then you just I picked mean, up residence and played with everybody. <laughs> oh, God, yeah. My uncle introduced me to a few people. He he took me where Muddy Waters was playing a, a club called Silvio's on the west side of Chicago. So he said, that's where Muddy Waters And he took me there to see Muddy. Because I wasn't old enough to get in by myself, so he took me there. I called Muddy, and then I started just, uh, wherever Muddy went uh, in town, I would just try my best to beat her. <laughs> what was that now, scene I, like in 1950, man? man I can't imagine. The, the talent, that the blues just, talent that was in that way. town. <laughs> Yeah, I just can't imagine. Oh, yeah, I got to see everybody. Little Walter, uh, Jimmy Reed. Oh, man. And I to, later on, I got to see Freddie King. And when I got to be good friends with Magic Sam, I was uh-huh. fresh. 
And I, I was just in my glory. I was, I was, I was like in in heaven, heaven for the music, you know, <laughs> night after but, night. Yeah, that kind of, I guess that was ground zero for, you know, that was, that was you're it. right, he- heaven for music, for, for blues. I mean, it didn't get any better. Oh, absolutely. It never will, and it yeah. never did before that. No. That's that's awesome. Yeah, yeah man. It hmm. did, no, so I, I assume, you know, you and your guitar went. Had you been, uh, before you moved to Chicago, had you been playing out and playing the blues or playing with any other friends in, in music? No, you know what? I, when I went to Chicago, I, I never even had a guitar. I never owned a guitar. Wow. Wow. My uncle used to have an old acoustic around the house when I was like 13, 13 years old and stuff. But I owned a, I owned a guitar after I came to Chicago. Hmm. I, I got a job at, at a little restaurant called Little Jack's Restaurant on Kids in Madison. And... Right next door to the restaurant, there was a pawn shop, and they had a couple of guitars hanging in the window. So I got a little job at Little Jack's restaurant, making thirty-seven dollars a week. So I had to pay my rent. Then there was a bank across the street from from the restaurant, and anything over my expenses, I would go and put it in that bank. So I finally got up enough nerve to go in the pawn shop. And I asked him, he had a, a, an Epiphone guitar and an Epiphone amp sitting in the window of the pawn shop. So I walked in and asked him how much he want for the guitar and amp, you know, the, the, both of them. So it says 175 bucks for the both, for the two. So I saved enough money just by saving a few bucks every week. I saved enough money, and I went in and bought that guitar and amp, an Epiphone amp and guitar. Yeah. I never will forget it because... I didn't even have a car at that time, so I had to take it home on the bus, on the amp and the guitar. <laughs> but I, I took it home with me. That was my first guitar. And that was American-made Epiphone, right? Oh, well, I oh yeah, so. yeah, 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 yeah. Nineteen, Epiphone. yeah, that then, yeah, absolutely, yeah, right. Yeah, yes, absolutely. Oh, yeah. Wow, that is so <laughs> cool, <crazy>. man. <laughs> and I, I just started practicing from there and going around the west side and the south side. And I could do an audition at a few taverns, and I said, I don't want to come. In. I want to come in and play for it. He said, Come in and do an audition. If we like it, we'll hire you. So I got two two musicians together, and I had a trio. A guy named John Hudson, and a, the drummer's name was Richard Rogers. Yeah. So we got together, and I was going with an uh, audition. And uh, if they liked me, they'd hire me for that weekend or for the, a couple of weekends. So that's how I started out. Wow, it's amazing. Yeah. Now, um, <laughs> and and your left hand. I was left-handed. guitar at the time. I was left-handed. Yeah. It, yeah, I was just going to bring yeah, that up. Yeah. It's it, it's it's so hard to find, you know, especially when you're dealing with pawn shops and not music stores and not looking to buy new. It's so hard to find left-handed guitars. There's you know there's so many yeah, more but... right-handed ones. So I that I assume that that's what forced you to learn. To play upside down, just the availability of uh, the lack of availability of left-handed guitars. Well, so you know what, I never knew at that time that they made guitars for left-handed players. <laughs> I never knew because because uh, I played without changing the strings. I just put it, pick it upside down and play it you know, on the left side. Mm-hmm. But, but later on, they started making guitars for left-handed people, but I still play a right-hand guitar as of today, because that's how I learned it. So you right. go to the she the same way, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's great. And that was kind of really for the left-handed guitar. Al- Albert King, same thing, right? Albert King? Or Freddie yeah, King? Albert King. Oh, exactly. Albert King, yeah. Albert, yeah. Yeah. Albert King, yeah. I get my yeah. kings mixed up sometimes. <laughs> yeah, they, the three of them, yeah. That's Albert, right. Freddie, and B.B. Yeah, man. Wow. The, the, the history is just amazing. I mean, uh, we could probably talk to you for, for a week and not get it all. <laughs> but it's just uh, – so you just started – literally just went up there, had not really done much, and then just started cutting your head that way and, and, and playing with all these guys that ended up – now, were they – 
were they fully established at that time? Were these guys like known on the scene, or were they coming up in the ranks? Oh yeah, locally, yeah. locally, Muddy was a big name at that time. Muddy Waters and Howlin' Wolf, okay. because they were already that they they started recording with Chess Records pretty early, wow. and uh, they were already established uh, locally. They were well established, so uh, I got to to meet like Freddie Freddie King and. Uh, the Muddy Waters, I did, it was the first one I met. Mm. And then the first one I really talked to was Magic Sam. After he came out with the, the, a couple of records that was very good, like All Your Love and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And I, he was appearing in, in the neighborhood I lived in at a club called, the, oh, it's a local club, uh, uh, uh it was like two blocks from my house. So I found out Magic Sam was going to be playing there that weekend. The Blue Flame, right, the Blue Flame. Uh-huh. So I got there early, got myself a seat right in front of the bandstand. <laughs> so Magic Sam came on and he did his show. And at the end of his set, he broke an E string. Yeah. But he didn't have any extra strings. <laughs> so, so he announced it over the mic. He said, I... I broke a string. Anybody have a, a, an extra E string? Because I, I don't have any extras. So I waited until he walked off the bandstand, and I walked up to him. I said, "You need a string?" I got that. I could see him when he broke the string, but I waited until he came off stage. I said, "You need a string?" He said, "Oh yeah, I, I need a, an E string bad because I don't have any extras." So I said, "Well, I have some at home, but I live a couple of blocks from here." He says, "Then well, you could get me one because I don't have any you know, replacements." So I ran home and got two E-strings and ran back to the club, to the Blue Flame, and walked in and handed them two E-strings in case they break another one. <laughs> so he said, oh, good. I said, I'm glad you got me a string. And he said, what's your name? I said, it, it called me Eddie Clearwater. He said, oh, I heard of you. And that's how we met over a guitar string. Oh, my God. <laughs> we that's right awesome. <laughs> that yeah, is awesome. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Mick, can you, can you imagine... Can can you imagine going out and playing a gig no. with like no no spare strings? It, well, not not only yeah, that. That's right. It, not only that, but it, can you imagine that you're on the scene when it's Muddy Waters and Helen Wolf? I mean, you know those guys. It just that's crazy, man. That is the this is the coolest yeah. story ever. We <laughs> we've had we've had tons of people on Eddie, and let me tell you, you are the you're the guy. Well, you know, we, we've well, never heard you. a story yet that, you know, somebody met a legend over a broken guitar string, you know? Yeah. That's just so cool. Yeah, that, exactly. That is it so It amazed cool. me because we, I just happened to be there when, when he broke a string that night. Because I was too shy to go up and talk to him. All the magic I do with this side of the clear blue. So that gave me a reason to go and talk to him. So I said, I'm going to get the string. And maybe I can introduce myself to him. So I did. He asked me, what you, what's your name? I said, Eddie Clearwater. He said, oh, yeah, I've heard of you. I've, I've been hearing about you. Then there was, everywhere he would go, if I had the time, I would show up. And then he'd call me up and say, we got Eddie Clearwater in the house. We're going to call him up, you know. And that's how I got to know him. Wow. So he actually called you up on stage to, to play? Oh, yeah. After he found out who I was. And, uh. Nice. He, he found out that I do a lot of Chuck Berry songs at that time. So he called me up and said, do one of those Chuck Berry songs. And I, would, I would do one of those, and I would do a blues song or something. And So that's how we became very good friends. Wow. That is so cool. That is so cool. Did you still have that uh, Epiphone guitar and amp at that time? Oh, no, I, I sold it a lot, a lot, a long time ago. I, after the Epiphone, I bought a silver tone. From Sears to Roebuck after that. But the amp wasn't worth nothing. <laughs> Silver tone amp was just not. But I, then I sold the, uh, that, the, uh, the Epiphone and got a Gibson. Ah. Gibson with the cutaway in it. Do you know what model Gibson it, it was or is? And do you still have it? Uh, no, no. I, I have, Now I'm playing a Gibson 335. Okay. And I, then a Gibson gave me a Gibson, a BB King Gibson, but I don't, I don't tour with that one much because it's, uh, 
after B.B. King signed it for me. So I, I keep uh, that close to my bedside. <laughs> well, I bet. I bet. So you, um, you do, do you remember what Gibson it was that you origi- originally had back in the day? Was it, was it a, like a Les Paul or? No, it had one cutaway. But it was a it was a it was a gold gold color. It was called a Gibson. I can't think what it's called. Gibson it had a one colorway. It was gold color painted. Okay. Not, I mean, I, not three thirty five. Not four. So it was. It, you don't think it was a Les Paul though? No, it was not a Les Paul. No. Not sure. a Les Paul. No, it was a Les Paul. You know, because I'm thinking, you know, at at some uh, point. Oh, a hollow body, single cut hollow body. Yeah, single cut hollow body. Yeah. Okay. Wow. I have to look into that. I'm I'm thinking at some point Eddie had like a, you know, a a a 54 gold top or something, and you know that he eventually wound up selling, and you know now you can buy a house with the thing. Oh God, yeah. It's like I had an old Fender. I had an old Fender. uh, Telecaster and sold it like a dummy. <laughs> sold it to a friend of mine, one of the early tellers. You know. Uh, you know, we we all have the the should have held on to that one story. You know, everybody's got at oh, least absolutely. one of those. Oh, so, yeah. so how um how did your career begin to progress after? you started sitting in with, with Magic Slim. I mean, how, you know, how did things move along for you from there? Well, I finally got, uh, I recorded an album for Rooster Blues Records, Jim O'Neill from Rooster Blues. Okay. And they called the album The Chief. So that was my first domestic album. I had did a couple of 45s and stuff, but not a complete album. So in 1979, I came back from Europe, and Jim O'Neill met me at, at the Kingston Mines in Chicago. He said, I'll meet you at the Mines tonight. I want to talk to you about doing an album on you. I said, oh, okay. So when I got to the club, he was standing out in front of the club. He said, well, I wanted to talk to you about I want to I want to do an album on you. Would you consider? I said, oh, absolutely, yes. So we did the album called the chief and then my name started to spread further and further and it was the way he he kind of advertised it pretty well and, uh, then I started to travel pretty national in, in the states and then uh, some of the European agents started to call me for engagement so I so I went to Europe and after that I started I had my first two I went to Europe was uh, with myself, Buddy Guy, and uh, Junior Wells when they were traveling together as wow. a team. And uh, from that, <laughs> oh yeah, Magic Sam and all this work. I mean, and, and uh, uh, Buddy Guy, I just I just played his club two weeks ago. Yeah. Oh, nice. Legends. So, uh, so I just kind of start to expand from that. You know. Thank God, it just kind of kept, kind of kept spreading. Uh, I did the East Coast a lot around Boston and uh, in New York at Tramps. There used to be a club called Tramps in New mm-hmm. York. And a lot of places. I did in Maryland, uh, Bethesda, Maryland. And, uh, oh, nice. Uh, totally. Oh yeah, right. You in Maryland for sure. Yeah. Do you remember where you played in Maryland? Yeah, it used to be a club called Tornado Alley. That's been yeah. a while ago. Tornado Alley. I think I remember. Maryland. Yeah. Yeah, Tornado Alley. So you you mentioned before you were approached about the album, you mentioned that you had just come back from England. Um and you mentioned touring a lot uh, in the U.S. In, in the States and in Europe after you had recorded the album. But you did mention you could just come back from Europe before you got approached about the album. So were you playing in Europe even then? 
Oh yeah. Yeah, then, yeah. and uh and seventy six and seventy nine. seventy nine I think it was. Oh, so you were you were playing in '79 in Europe? Oh yeah, right. Oh yeah. And, nice. But I had never did an album. I just had, I did a couple of a few forty fives. Oh, okay. I really didn't want to, want to do an album and when I came back, and he just, so he put together a session. And I wrote a few songs, and uh, I can I still have copies of the album now called The Chief. Nice. Did you? Uh, you said you had recorded some forty fives before that. Do you? Were they originals or were they covers of songs? Originals. Yeah, I did. A, my first record was a song I wrote called "Boogie Woogie Baby" and then it's flip side of "Hillbilly Blues." I happen to have a copy of it now. <laughs> oh, nice. So you still have some original copies? Oh, I do. Yeah, I do. Very nice. <laughs> Um, where was I going to go with this? Oh, the uh, when you, after the album, you started. Um, you were you were touring with those guys. Were you kind of like opening for them in in their in their tour? Yes, no, it, was, it was a whole cast. It was the way they were doing then. They would put you got a whole cast. Mm-hmm. Okay, buddy guy, Junior Wells, and myself. And Jimmy Johnson, and another singer named Boris Odom, we were all on tour together, and uh, it was 21 days. Hey, hey, you can look it up on the website. It's a, uh, just look up Eddie Clearwater in Europe with Buddy Guy and Junior Wills. It's nice. 1979, I think, 76 or 79. Yeah, it, it's on the website. It's on the, with my first European tour with Buddy Guy and Junior Wells. Well, we I went to last week because my brothers wanted to know something about it. I said, I can put it up on the internet for you. You know, so <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah. It, it's nice to have some history there, isn't it? You know. Oh yeah. yeah I mean, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm impressed. I'm impressed that you can remember as much as you do, you know, and I'm not saying that in any derogatory so way, but man, that's, you know, it's so long ago and you've, you've done so much, you know, to be able to recall, you know, things, Honestly, back from the fifties when you moved to Chicago, that's 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 great. Yeah, that's, sometimes it's hard to remember, but <laughs> sometimes it just come up, it comes natural in your head, you know. So. Yeah, well, uh, so when you were touring with them, uh, were you playing your three thirty-five then, and and if so, or even if not, you know, what were you playing, and what kind of amp did you? decide that you really liked or have you ever found one or need you know fa- excuse me Fender twin yes a twin uh, Fender, Fender twin yes. I'm, I'm using the Fender reverb now but I got I got four twins and I got two Fender reverbs so the guy made me a, a a Fender reverb a Fender twin rather and he called it the, the, uh, the chief super chief you know, <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's kind of your sound, you you and oh, yeah. I guess a, a three thirty five. Three thirty five and guitar, and I have a, a Fender uh, Stratocaster, and also one Fender Telecaster now, oh. and an Epiphone. I have an Epiphone also. We'll and new Epiphone. do you do you? Um, do you plug straight in? Or do you use any kind of pedals to yeah, get? Yeah, I, I don't. I don't use. Uh, I don't use uh, pedals at all. I have a bunch of them, but I, I prefer just to just to sound through the amp, the amp and the guitar. Nice, I, you know, and it, I mean, the Twin is a great amp, but it's it's loud and clean, and a lot of a lot of players need to find a way to get more overdrive into their right, sound, yeah. you know, yeah. but, you know, you just, it, it, I, I, I was I listening to clips. Amp. Excuse me? No, I, I just set the amp. Yeah. And get, trying to get the sound that I want from there. Well, it's, it's obvious, a lot of it is obviously in, in your fingers, in your left and right hand, it's, you know, yeah. it's, it's, oh, yeah. 
it's picking, you know, yeah, well, yeah, that's that, all good players are like that. They can, most players that are really good, like yourself, can plug into almost anything and get what they want out of the guitar and amp because oh, yeah. they're so, you know, gifted in the hands. Well, you got to put, you know, the way you bend your strings, yeah, that's. Sure. I mean, it's not only bending, it's, you know, you can, you push it the right way to get a little bit of overdrive happening. And just by picking differently, you get nice cleans, you know, there's, it is, it is truly a very, um, straightforward, great blues sound that you get. And oh, it's just, it's, it's yeah. just coming from your guitar and amp. That's, that is so cool. From your guitar and amp, yes. That's how you create a sound. That's how. That's what Otis Rush does. You know, he just plays his guitar, his amp, and the way he bends, it's make it a drive out of your mind. <laughs> Something else. God, the way he bends those strings. Now, when when you started playing, did you did you try to model yourself after any one of of the blues greats that that you were? coming up with was there any one guy in particular that you really liked his style or just really kind of you absorbed it or you know rubbed off on you the right way well i like a lot of different sounds like for instance okay i, I like what magic sam is playing then i like what chuck berry is playing because i like his lyrics and his his, his guitar licks it coincides so well with what he's singing and playing it, it just coincided well. Then I love B.B. King, and uh, I love Albert King. Yes. Uh, I mm. hear something from a lot of different people that is, that is very appealing. Yeah, I mean, personally, uh, of the Kings, Albert's my favorite. You know, oh, I, God, yeah. He's, uh, he, he's a bender. <laughs> oh, uh, for yeah. sure. Yeah. For sure. sure. It's um yeah he he's I, I just I I like his voice and his playing style and his tone very much. Oh God, he had a great tone, yes. Yeah, and he's a uh, you know a lot of times uh, flying V for him, you know. Oh, that's what he used flying V. That was, yeah, that's his signature guitar. Yeah, flying V. Yeah. So um. Let me see. Where did we go? We we went guitar and amp. Um, uh, how uh, are you recording anything now, or ha is has there you know been anything recorded in the recent past that um, you know people should know about? And are you yeah, touring well, with well, it? John, behind? John, 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 he didn't send you any any of my work, huh? You know, Honestly, he, 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 he might have sent some I'll to me. He might have sent some to Mick, and I did. I just haven't seen it yet. Okay. But that's okay. That's fine. If Mick has so it, I will I hear it. You one of my, I can send you one of my latest albums. That that would be awesome. How many? How many do you have? Uh, all together with the one with the last one I did, which is a live one. Uh, uh, I did it live. I think it was seventeen. I seventeen or eighteen albums. I think so. Wow. Well, I'm working on a new one right now. That's, that's, what I'm, that's why I'm so hoarse now. I've been <laughs> working on songs you know, for my new album. Wow. Now, have you um, have you continued to tour the whole time? And Well, you just did a live album, so obviously you are still, you know, you're still out there doing oh, yeah, it. I'm still performing. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Uh, it's, uh, as long as I'm in health, I'll do it. Because I do it for the love of the music, really. That's awesome. Now, do you do you have a um, a regular band that tours with you, or do you use oh, yeah. pick up guys? You know, I mean, because Chuck Berry used to come into town, you know, later on. Yeah, he would always travel solo. He would just travel solo and pick up use pick up bands. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, so I have a, uh, four guys. Uh, Tom, my my guitar player lives out in Connecticut. He lives out east. Yeah, mm -hmm. Tom Quivelon. And I have a harp player, Shoji Naito. He plays harp and guitar and bass. And then I have a drummer, Steve Steve Bass. is my drummer. Mm -hmm. That's my traveling band. 
have you been together along with these guys? Oh yeah, uh, Shoji's been with me for twelve years. The, the, the guitar player and the uh, the harp player, and Tom Quivelon been with me for like what, just five years. Wow. Yeah, Steve, still five years is a long time. I mean, you you know, you start to get to know each other. You start to get to know each other musically well, after five years. Absolutely. And that yeah, that's that's always a good feeling because it, they know what you're going to do and they know what they have to do. And yeah, that's oh, it yeah, makes for a great show. You get to know your music. You get to know your music and it, that's what's important. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it definitely makes for a great show. Um, well, what else was I going? I had something on the tip of my tongue that I was going to ask you, and now I don't remember it. Um, you know what? Hmm. You have my phone number now. If there's anything you want to ask me, do me a favor. Please call me back whenever you want to, and I'll be happy to try and answer it, you know, because uh, I definitely want you to know what, what I'm doing. And, uh, and the only way you can know is, is ask and find out. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So you're working on a new release now. Uh, any idea right. when that might be done? Hopefully sometime next year, next year it should come out. Yeah, but around, hopefully around September, October of next year. Because I'm, all, I'm doing all the original songs. That's why, that's why I'm taking a lot of pain with it. A lot of time. Okay. So, but you're writing, you're writing all new, new material for this yeah, album. Yeah, all, all new, all new songs. Yeah. I have a lot of them written already, but I'm still working on some new ideas that I'm working on. I'm writing one called These Old Blues. That's one of the ones. These nice. Old blues. Now, do you, um, do you rehearse them extensively first before you go into the studio, or you just go into the studio with oh, a bunch yeah. of ideas? Yeah. You know, I rehearse them with, with myself, by myself, and then with the band, I try to cover all areas of it. Let's see exactly where everything should go when I get to the studio. Mm -hmm. Where are you recording? The Wax Track. The last, the last studio album I did for, for Alligator Records was done at Wax Track. Rick Barnes, the engineer. Okay. Wax tracks, huh? Uh, sorry, I had to right, I had to track. step away there. I'm back now. Um, <laughs> it's okay. So I guess you uh you yeah, asked uh you asked uh Eddie if he uh recorded with Amps or Virtual, right? <laughs> I actually I haven't yet. I was I just just asking where he was because he's recording a new one that you know expects to be out next year. I think we and know I that was asking though, Jeff. where he was recording. Yeah, but. Well, hey, you never know. You never know. But uh, so we, yeah, we we have this this question that we try to ask people uh, that are in the studio recording. Do you prefer to record with an amplifier, or have you moved into technology where you just kind of plug straight into the board and pick oh, up? Oh no, I prefer recording with an amp. You had to run the amp through through the through the system. Yeah, there you but, go. But uh, I like the sound of the amp. Yeah, well, you know, the sound of of your guitar straight into a twin, you know, obviously has like we were saying this this great just great basic blues tone, and it's very oh, absolutely. Yeah. It's it's very musical and um, soulful, and you know, I, I I would we would have assumed that somebody like you would prefer. Yeah. To, p to play the same rig in the studio, throw a mic oh, in front yeah, of it I because like that's what Eddie sound. sounds like. The same sound I get in the club, I like to like to produce that sound here yeah, for the recording. Yeah. That's beautiful, yeah. man. That and is cool. We, um, we did with uh, the West Side Strut. Uh, I'm going to send you a copy of the of the West Side Strut. If you don't, are you sure you don't have a copy of it on Alligator Records? Uh, uh, because I send it out. I send it out to you today. Well, that would be great. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Yeah, I think it's absolutely. You got it. You consider you have it already. Yeah. But let me get let let me let my wife get your your mailing address and everything, so she'll send it to you. Oh. And, uh, sure, we can we can do that after we wrap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, is there a website that you have or any kind of social me media? Uh, yeah, right. That that's the information that Renee is going to give you when I put it all on. <laughs> Okay, we will get that information, and that will live on the show in perpetuity. That's right. 
And I know uh, there's a website. Yeah. I've seen the website. Yeah, and we'll we'll make sure that all that stuff is included with the show, like we always do with all of our guests. And then, sure. uh, you know, look, the, we we have covered. We have safely covered every single area of music and um, oh, yeah. from, that. from yeah. the guys that do country, young guys to, you know, guys mm-hmm. like oh, yourself, yeah. man, who've been there since the beginning. <laughs> and yeah. uh, you know, really? we can't thank you enough for being on the show, man. I mean, that's just this oh, is just too to cool. That's, you know, it's it's more Chicago royalty, man. Yeah, it's, man. He's he's up there with all the all the Chicago royalty. Oh, absolutely. I appreciate the conversation. That's great, really. <laughs> uh, so let, let me let you let me let you talk with her. Renee and she she'll give you she'll get all of your information we'll send you out send you out a copy that you you may not have if it's if, if so. Thank let you, sir. Little, yeah, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Eddie, oh, Eddie, yeah. before you go before you go. Thank yeah, you man. thank you so very much. <laughs> for being on the show and taking the time oh. and uh, much uh, continued uh, success. Good luck with the new album. Oh. And uh, if you, if you wind up touring in the Northeast, somewhere around the Maryland area, hopefully we can get a chance to come yeah. out and see you. And one thing before we oh, let, next year. before we let you go though. Oh, are you there? Oh, yeah, go ahead. Okay. Right. I just want to, and, and Jeff, I, I know you want to say the same thing. We want to say uh, happy birthday because uh, coming up on the tenth, uh, you're going to be January. yeah, you're going to be what eighty three years young? Is that what we're talking? I will be for sure. That's right. Yeah, wow. I will be uh, correct. That that is awesome, man. That is so cool that you're still doing it after all these years, man. And, and we've been doing it. My birthday for five years at the same club at Space. Oh. And every time it's, it's always sold out. It's always totally sold out. It should be. <laughs> That's right, as it should be. As it should be. Well, Eddie, you know, have a blessed birthday, man. And yeah. it's, wow, what a what a life. Yeah, man. Thank you. Uh, and there you have the story. Hey. And I and you know what? Now I got to listen to the show because I had to walk away. I had a little family emergency going on. I'm bummed about that, but I get to listen because I'll listen to it like four times by the time I get this out. <laughs> but uh, that's right. How how great is that, man? How great is yeah, that? Yeah, it's just and you know I was I was speaking to him about like just his memory of things mm-hmm. back from 1950. Yeah, you know dude. and you know yeah. You, and he got look, to hang with the greats. He got, look, oh, he's one of them. Look, I, I I say it all the time. You know, we we have we have guys that you know that don't even know you have songs that we've grew up with and stuff. I mean, we that's how young we've gone, mm-hmm. and we've got guys like Eddie who was there, literally building that foundation so these young guys could have what they're doing today. Yeah, you know, and. Um, Man, I, I, it's like I struck oil with this one. <laughs> I'm serious. I, it was this was an email that was just sent over, and I was like, "Oh my god!" You know, and what do you what do you say? No, or oh well, oh, no, we'll I... get to him. No, you got to take it, man. And that's just the way it is because I knew that he grew up in that time. When I saw his wiki, I was like, "Oh, this is just crazy," you know, yeah. hanging with all those cats, and yeah, to still that's... be doing it. It's just amazing, man. Mm-hmm. You know, and and God bless like, him. Good God. Like you said, it's you know, he, he's gonna as long as he has his health, he's gonna keep doing it. And so. and you know what? That's the way it should be, man. You know, right. it, it, you can't. You, like I always say, man, you get stagnant. That's when it usually takes you. So you got to kind of be, mm-hmm. you know, uh, mm-hmm. ahead of the game. I should say. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, this this is another guy. You know that. You know, you could. It's just a ridiculous question to ask him. It's like, well, are you, you going to retire someday? Like, retire, <laughs> re, retire from what? Exactly. Retire from what? You know, it's. Uh, I'm, I'm not working in, in an office nine to five. Yeah, man. You know, yeah. he started that job in 1950. He's still going strong. God bless mm-hmm. him. I mean, it's like he would be retiring from his life. Exactly. Because that's. Yeah. That's what it is. So. Yeah, man. It's cool, man. So until next time, my friend. That's right, because you never know. Could be young, could be old. Ooh, that's right, but baby. But it's going to be good. <laughs> I'm Mick Marcelino. I'm Jeff Bober. And we're always saying. Onward. Be sure and follow the show on Twitter, at Amson Axis. Also, make sure you like the show on Facebook. 
For news, comments, and everything else, visit the webpage, ampsandaxiscast.com. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.